Hello, hello everybody and welcome. I'm Sean Kokoska, founder of Icon Coaching, where we bring the proven best practices to each and every one of you in the real estate industry from those real world icons that are actually doing it. And today we've got Mark Spain, which by the way, he's got an impressive resume. Before I get into that though, let me just say, welcome to the, to the webinar, Mark, how you doing? Hey, glad to be here, appreciate you having me. All right, so you're based in Atlanta, Georgia. I was just out at your office a couple of weeks ago doing some training with your buyer's agents, having a blast doing it. Thanks for having me out. You're quite welcome. It was a great day. It was a great day, no doubt about it. So uh, I'm just going to share my screen. There might be about a two second pause here as I do that. Don't worry. Nothing's going wrong. I just want to go through just a, a couple of accolades and things that you've accomplished, Mark, just to let these guys know why they want to be here today and not leave this webinar until it's over. So here we go. Three thousand homes this year alone, Mark. Congratulations! Um, obviously, uh, top one hundred fastest growing privately held companies. You've uh, from the uh, uh, Atlanta Business Chronicle. You've been awarded the best places to work for small business, as well as uh, you know, been endorsed by Barbara Corcoran from the Shark Tank. That's phenomenal. And uh, you've also been um, granted the Real Estate Marketer of the Year, and um, you're the Atlanta Board of Realtors Crystal Phoenix Award recipient. Now that you gain because of 20 years in multi-million dollar sales club. Congratulations, buddy. So what's next for Mark Spain? Yeah, I think for us is we just keep scaling and growing our model. We've uh, we have a we have an awesome model. It really just goes back to people, leads, leadership. Um, we just try to really simplify our model over the last several years and, and create things that are scalable. So for right now, uh, we went independent about 19 months ago. And right now we're in the process of opening offices throughout Metro Atlanta. So we just opened up our fourth and uh, I was out this morning on the east side of town looking for our fifth office. Um, so just really building out the infrastructure as far as offices in Atlanta. Uh, we have an office in Athens, and then as we move into 2018, uh, we'll work our way north to you know, Greenville, Charlotte, Raleigh. And I don't know if you heard me as I switched the screens back yet. Uh, Mark, what I'd like for you to do is just share with us all your philosophy, your philosophies around your expansion model. In essence, why are you focused on Atlanta right now, where I'm, I'm hearing of agents that, for example, they love to visit Hawaii, so they're going to open up an office over in Hawaii. Uh, or maybe um, they, they love the West Coast, yet they're based on the East Coast, so they're going to open an office in San Diego. Talk to me about your philosophy around expansion. Yeah, so the, 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 our initial phase of expansion is really just, hey, you have to have a model that's and a lead generation system that's scalable. Um, and so we have that and, you, and you, we really have worked on the last three years, just really systemizing our team and really knowing our metrics so that we can, we can track. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the lead generation side of the business is just math. Um, and same thing on the agent side. I mean, it goes just really back to math and conversion rate. So you have to generate X number of leads, have an X percentage of conversion rate to spit out an X number of deals per month or per year. Um, and so for us, we're building out the grid in Atlanta. I mean, Atlanta is a huge, huge city. It's a huge MSA. I mean, it's almost 7 million people. Um, so for us, we want to we want to have a headquarters and then an east and a west and a north and a south office, as well as stretch to the – we stretch through Athens to basically build out that office so that we tested a new MLS. We tested an office that's, you know, within 70 miles of our current office in case something happened. We had to run down there. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, it's running well. I mean, that, that office has been open, say Athens, which is our furthest reach and expansion about 75 miles from our headquarters. We did last month, like we listed 23 houses and we pended 25. So, I mean, that's for a micro market of 20, uh, you know, 95,000 people in a very small ancestrous type town. Uh, that, that's a huge success. I mean, I, I get more excited than that than closing 200 houses in Atlanta, just because that's hard to do. No doubt about that. All right. So we're going to talk uh, kind of big picture a little bit later. Yet what I want to do is get a little more macro. 
I want to add value to all of our participants today in you know such a way that they can take some actionable items today to get their trajectory as such to to be able to become a, a top producer like a Mark Spain, like some of the past you know webinar icons of the month the attendees like Rhonda Duffy and and John Murray and uh, Greg Harrelson, Brian North, and uh, those that I've forgotten, I apologize yet. Uh, let's go a little more macro and let's think back to when you first started in real estate. Now, it's in your blood, you're second, second generation real estate entrepreneur, obviously, yet when you first started out, it wasn't about even thinking about expansion. It wasn't uh, about thinking about the numbers necessarily. So what did you do to really get your start in real estate? Yeah, so I mean, my, my career, I mean, I started on site at, at working for a builder on site named Colony Homes, which was later acquired by Kaufman and Broad. Um, that's where I cut my teeth. When I, in 1997, when I decided to go into general brokerage, uh, I joined my dad back in the day at Remax. And I remember a broker said, hey, you need to go to this David Knox seminar. And it, this, this particular piece of information has stuck on me my whole career. And I walked away from that one hour seminar with the words, you got a list to last, list to last. And it was like, it basically said, hey, if you want to you want to leverage yourself in this business, you really have to focus on listings because buyers are a byproduct of listings. And to this day, I mean, we, we are a heavily on the listing side of the business. I mean, I bet you we're probably 70 percent listings, 30 percent buyers. And if you look at major teams, we're a little bit of an anomaly in the sense that we have such a heavy listing team. A lot of a lot of my friends have have. Uh, a lot heavier buyer business uh, where they bought an aggregated type leads where we just really haven't done that on a huge basis. I mean, we've dabbled a little bit in some Zillow stuff, but I mean, not, not like a lot of my colleagues have. So we really just focused our lead gener lead generation efforts, you know, starting 20 years ago on, on, on the, on the seller and it's, it's paid off. I mean, because if you have eight, 900 listings in a town or a hundred or 50, whatever your number is, you know, my dad used to say, you can't sell watermelons from an empty truck. And so for us, we always want to keep our truck loaded up. So if we run out of listings, we're not going to have anything to sell to any buyers. And so that's been our focus. Well, that's fantastic. Okay. So you start as a new home sales agent. Yeah. Right. And then you decide to go into to brokerage. What was your lead generation strategy? I mean, obviously you didn't have the marketing budget you have today yet. How did you start developing leads? Yeah. So I'm, I, one thing you'll learn about me is I'm a big student and, and when I want to, when I want to learn and perfect something, I really put my heart and soul into learning everything I can about it. So I, mean, I just started studying lead generation methods and, and what, you know, because what you use to attract a buyer, which is really just advertising your leads, your, your listings is very different than how you, how you advertise to get sellers. And so I just really went out and studied, you know, I became a big student of Hobbs Herder and, um, uh, I started a postcard, you know, we basically started a postcard advertising campaign and, you know, um, created a personal brochure and mailers and letters. But also what Hobbs Herder taught me and what I felt like they were really good at at the time is they really had knew the math behind mailing and target marketing and didn't do as much in TV and billboards. But they did understand the the, the you know, cost per thousand type CPM model, which is just an advertising term. Um, how much it costs to reach a thousand people. And I, and I started mailing out to, you know, um, I basically what I did is, and, and I learned, I learned this as well from Hobbs Herder is you, you, if you find your niche, you'll get rich. I like the Allen Dome type model. And mm -hmm. these are guys I've studied back then. And I said, okay, how, if I'm going to do mailers to neighborhoods, how can I be different? What can be my niche? You know, could it be, I graduated from University of Georgia and I'm going to, I'm going to attract, I'm going to go after UGA graduates or I grew up in Snowville, which is a geography farm or what is my niche? And I said, how can I be different? So what I said, you know what, the builder I just worked for colony homes builds one of them, a great pr product at a price range that I want to work. That's the type of clientele I want to work with. And I know every single floor plan. I know every single component about the house. There's not a real estate agent in America that knows more about, you know, a resale agent that knows more about their product. So I said, you know what I'm going to be? I'm going to become the colony homes resale expert. You could tell me any floor plan you had. I could tell you how many square footage, what who put the siding on, what kind of panel box you had, what kind of cabinets. If you had a warranty issue, I could get it fixed. And it's like, it worked. 
And I just started really mailing postcards and, and I'm, I tend to be very aggressive and Hobbs Herder's approach back then was very aggressive. So I would mail postcards to just say I had 35 neighborhoods, maybe 2,500 homes that I mailed to. So for, I mail a postcard a week for eight weeks straight. And then I mailed them three times a month for the rest of their life or as long as I was in that campaign. And then every time I listed a house in that neighborhood, I sent out a just sold card and every time I, I mean, just listed. And then every time I sold one, I sent a just sold. So some people would get 10 pieces of mail from me a month. And it was so aggressive that I'd have people either come to my office and bring the postcard and say, quit mailing to me or call up to our office screaming at me. And I said, you know what? That's when you know you're doing it right. And, and, and when, and, and all that sounds like a lot and a lot to manage, but what I did was, again, I'm a systems guy. I'm a big Michael Gerber, e guy. I went to a mailing house in town and I found out, you know, who, who's the biggest mailing house. I came went down, I met with them, I educated myself and I said, Hey, I need to create a system. So every time I list a house, I need to send you the MLS sheet with a photo. I need you to take the photo off, download on this postcard template and send it to this neighborhood. And it just created a system and, I, and it just worked. And my business began to take off and I grew and grew and grew. And then I started doing the same thing with newspaper ads. Then I did the same thing with billboards. And, you know, back then I started out with one billboard. Today I have like 150 billboards. And it's just, it's, it's learning what works, red light, green light type revenue model. And when it works, you just lay into it. And you, and you, you lay into it until you max that source out and then you go to the next source. You don't try to do 50,000 things at one time. You pick one thing, you perfect that one, th you know, you perfect that one source and, and you lay into it until you, max it out and then you go to the next one. Don't try to do 10 things at one time. You'll never do it. That's great advice. I love that you keep using this word system. See a system to me is nothing more and nothing less than a standardized process that produces a consistent and predictable result. So by understanding the numbers, you have an opportunity to really bring it out to, to maximize it as Mark said. Great job, Mark. What other advice? Let's just say that that one of your listing specialists comes to you and they're struggling. What advice would you give them to generate more listings? Yeah, but if, I'm going to say one thing real quick before we jump on about systems. And one thing that I think that I, that I see so many people in business that they don't know is they don't know their numbers. And no matter what you do, you, 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 first of all, I'd say read the book Michael, you know, by Michael Gerber, the E-Myth, and, and really master systems and understand the process of systemizing and then in today's world, utilize technology to help you systemize. So, for instance, I'll give you an example of one of one of our one of our things that we do. That I'm a big numbers guy, and I want to know. Every, and I'm all about leads. Every day at eight thirty, our system shoots me out a report that says, "This is how many CMAs we had today, listing leads. This is how many buyer leads. This is the sources. This is how many contracts we wrote." I know everything about our company in one dashboard. And then you're going, wow, I don't need all that crazy. You know, that's just too much. Well, how I used to do it was we did it with an Excel spreadsheet or we just counted manually on the leads. And my admin would just send me a, an email the other night and said, hey, we got 13, whatever, 13 buyer leads, three seller leads. But know your numbers, know where your sources are so that you know what works, especially when you're spending money to advertise. I mean, because advertising is just math and marketing is math. And you got to understand the math behind it and how much you're willing to pay for a lead. Uh, and then make sure you always, 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 always know your numbers. I mean, successful business people know their numbers. The ones that, because when a market shifts, which, you know, it, it does is from time to time, you got to know when to bury things back and learn what things aren't working. But if you're not paying attention, you can get buried very quickly and quickly be pushed out of business. So, um, I just, I just wanted to reiterate that, Sean, because I think for me is that's what makes our business work. And that's what makes it grow fast is we know our numbers and we know when to lean into things which are working and we know when to cut things when they're not. Uh, are we yeah. perfect? No, but you, we do know our numbers. Yeah. And I just want to underline what you said, Mark. If you haven't read the email by Michael Gerber yet, I would strongly recommend it. In fact, when I read it back in the, in the 90s, I immediately reached out to them. I got my email certification. That then led to the development of 19 systems books around real estate that Diana and I sold to thousands and thousands of realtors. So uh, I, I strongly, strongly recommend you and encourage you to read that. So great job. So let's just say one of your agents comes to you, Mark, they're struggling. Okay. What advice would you give them on how to get their next listing? Yeah, so, and that does happen for me. I mean, our culture and our company, I mean, we have about 110 people here is just, I'm a big believer in, in a flat 
organization, meaning that I hate titles and I, I really just want to have an open. So we do, I do have agents that come in and say, Hey, you know, what, what can I do? Or I can just look at their face. Usually know they're not doing it well. Um, I mean, really it just, <laughs> it usually shows. And uh, I'll sit them down and just say, Hey, you know, let, let's just go through the basics. Okay. So, so two months ago you listed six houses, but last month you listed one. I mean, what are you doing different? You got the same amount of leads. And we just walk through either either they got off focus or they tried to get fancy with something. Uh, but most of the time, I'll be honest with you, most of the time I find their issues in their calendar. And I find that they listed six and then the next month they sold four and they had all this new business that they were having to deal with as far as uh, dealing with business and having to do negotiate contracts, inspections that they got so bogged down because they were disorganized that if I said, hey, I mean, one of my favorite quotes from 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 Gary was uh, new business. I mean, uh, taking care of business never, never takes precedence over dealing with new business. And which that means is always focus on bringing in new business into the pipeline, taking care of business, meaning like negotiating contracts and working on inspections and all that. It's going to be there, but that's tier two. You always have to keep your pipeline flush with new business coming into your world. And so I'm a big believer in follow up. And, and really perfecting the transaction, meaning that when my agents go to the house, I want them to be the very, very, very best savant agent, rock star. You know, uh, I'm going to tell them that, you know, your mindset probably is not right. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to dictate anything. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them a series of questions like, tell me, tell me what podcast you're listening to you know, on, on the way to work. What are you listening to? Are you reading 20 minutes a day? Cause used to, I was a little crazy and I'd say, you know, on the way to work, I need you to listen to this much. And on the way home, I need you to listen. And then when you go to bed, I mean, now I've learned to said, okay, pick one way. Just pick either to or from work. I'd say to work, but pick one, but get your mindset right. So that by the time you get to the office, I mean, this is a hard, hard business and it'll kick your tail every day if you let it, but it's better for you to take control of your day. Just get your mindset right first. Let's get your calendar right second. And let's start getting in, leaning into what works, meaning that, OK, if, if the sales means at nine, get here at 730 because the people who make the most money in this company and who do the best get here early. There's only a handful of you and spend an hour and a half getting organized. Go to your sales meeting, follow up. Don't book any appointments before noon. Go to lunch and then you do your appointments in the afternoon. And if you don't have any appointments, go preview some properties. Just go out and get your mindset back flush and get back right in your head. And if you'll do that and start having a, a better mindset, you would be surprised how your world changes in it. it. It works every single time. The only time it doesn't work is when they don't do what they're supposed to do. And then they'll come back to you and I'm like, all right, what are you doing? And they're like, I know, but I had this and I had that. And I'm like, okay. You yeah. Know. Well, there's magic in what you just said. And that's master the early mornings, uh, excuse me, the early morning hours of the day. Just Take care of the things you need to take care of before noon. And then afternoon, it really doesn't much matter as long as you've done the most important tasks, which for most of you, it's going to be lead generation, lead follow up. Right. In fact, uh, your job description, your top 20 percent activities that will yield at least 80 percent of your result is really simple. There's just five things. Right. It's lead generate, lead follow up on appointments, negotiate your contracts and practice your skill. That's right. And then successfully through technology and people to delegate that 80% stuff. Yet uh, I think one of the best bits of advice that I ever received was to, to look at your time in two separate buckets, at least your work life, right? Uh, the eight hours in a day, eight to noon, you focus on the 20% activities, give an inordinate amount of time to that. And then afternoon, do whatever the heck you want to do because you've already done what you need to do to grow your business. Mark, right. would you agree? Yeah. And I'm a big believer in just in that morning ritual where, I mean, life is really 80% habits. I mean, and it's, it's getting up every day. It's working out. I don't care if you just say, I don't work out. And I'm like, all right, well, you can walk around your neighborhood for 20 minutes. I mean, do something to get your energy level up. But what it also does is just by exercising, I'm a big, big believer in exercising in the morning is if you exercise for 30 minutes to an hour every single day, your mood will lift because it releases serotonin, but also, it keeps you, it keeps your stress level from getting to a 10 and maybe only gets to a seven. And then you actually have a lot more energy to deal with this business. I mean, this business is not simple because you're dealing with people and humans and emotions and dogs and cats and babies and moving and it can eat your lunch if you let it. <laughs> so just, I don't, I don't want it. I don't want it to eat your lunch. I want you to enjoy it 
but you got to take care of yourself and you got to eat healthy and you got to do all those things that, that go into building a world-class athlete because you are an athlete. I look at this as sports. I mean, you're an athlete and you got to prepare yourself. Just like you said, script practice, we're big, big believers in training and script practicing and, you know, really just perfecting the daily rituals. No doubt about it. You know, one of the things my mother always told me is that spontaneity is a condition to reflect. <laughs> <laughs> the more you condition yourself, the more you can be, uh, appear to be spontaneous. So practice right. your dialogues. That it, it appears that you're spontaneous, yet you've just mastered that objection handler. So good right. job. Um, what other advice would you give to our, our listeners today? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, like in our organization, I mean, you – you can't, you, if you're not a learner, you're going to get lost in this world. I mean, you're not, I mean, we're constantly reading books and learning and studying together and bringing in outside trainers, but it's just, there's two things that are going to, that are going to change your life that are going to affect the trajectory of your life. And that's, it's really just all goes into personal development, but it's really the people you hang around with and the amount of books and, th and things that you put into your mind, whether it be books, podcasts, audible.com, Anthony Robbins seminars, whatever that is. I mean, you're never going to get there. And you're never going to perfect anything, but do your very best to marinate your mind and, and education. And become, sales is a learned skill. And mm -hmm. you, you will hear me throughout conversations with me that I'm always reading books. I'm always studying things. I'm always trying to get better because guess what? You never make it there and, and, you, and, you, and you might as well enjoy the journey. Um, it, it, this is not a difficult business. I mean... It, it, we make it a lot more complicated than it is because we chase shiny things and we get distracted. Um, but you really, it, it, just, it really just goes back into simplification. So if you're a single agent pr practitioner and you come to me and say, Hey, I'm new in the business. What should I do? I mean, I'm going to tell you three or four books that, to go read. And I'm going to tell you to lead generate three to four hours a day, every single day, the rest of your life until you can find somebody else that you can, that can help you do it. Um, and if you'll do that, you know, three to four hours a day, five days a week, five and a half days a week, 50 weeks a year, I guarantee you'll make a fortune. The problem is there's only about 1% of the people that I'm talking to that will ever do that. And the ones that do list three or four houses a month and they come back and found me at a seminar or at a convention and say, Oh my God, you told me this and I did it. I'm like, wow. I mean, that, that warms my heart. Um, the nice. other ones that complain and stuff, they, they won't do that stuff. Yeah. See, I believe we all need a personal growth plan and be intentional about that growth because Bottom line is our business is going to grow to the extent that we grow, right? And it seems like every time I read a book, it stretches my mind and I'd start taking maybe a little bit different action and the results begin to improve. So Mark, that's some sound, solid, I mean, just wisdom. So somebody asked, Rick, in fact, asked, uh, he said, please ask Superman, I mean, oops, Super Spain, <laughs> what CRM he uses and recommends. Uh, he said, he has followed you and man, you're good. <laughs> well, thank you, Rick. Um, I don't recommend this unless you have an enterprise, you know, a, a large, um, I'll tell you what we use and then we can kind of talk through some things. Um, we use Salesforce. Um, it's just because we have so many people and we have so many systems that we needed to connect. Um, prior to Salesforce that worked just good for us, uh, we use Top Producer. Is it great? I mean, none of them are great. I mean, I'm going to tell you, there's no system out there that's going to do everything you want it to do. The main thing is just to have a system. Um, there, there, there are a ton, ton of products out there. Um, I would probably just just take take five or six of them and just get a spreadsheet and just find the pluses and minuses, do the demos and decide which, what, which features you need because some of them have so many features that you'll never use them. Um, but, but find one that works in your world. I mean, Salesforce is not simple. It's hard to implement. You have to have an administrator and it's very complicated. It's, it's not something that off the bat I'd recommend. Hope that helps. Gotcha. Yes. And, and sound advice as well, no doubt. So a um, couple of other questions. Uh, Brian asks, what is the best out of the box thing that you've done to get seller leads? Out of the box. Is there a such thing? <laughs> um, I mean, for me, I, like, I, like, I have relation. I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, I had relationships with builders. So um, for about 20 years, I've had relationships. I came from the new construction world um, and I'll give you a couple of things. And, and I basically just went to the builders around town and said, hey, let me manage your contingencies, meaning that let me manage people who have homes to sell uh, that come into your neighborhood. And I'll add a ton of value to you. I'll do all kinds of research for you. I mean, I, I don't, don't want to be just a taker to you, Mr. Builder. I want to be a resource, a tool in your toolbox. 
A, how I make money is to do your contingencies. But B, you wanted me to do research on any land purchase you're buying. Any person coming in here to buy a house that's not going to listen to me, I'll do the research. And so it's, it's, it goes back to that Adam Grant's give and take. I mean, I gave a lot, but they also gave me a lot. And then now I have a, you know, like a 20 year relationship with a lot of the national builders here in town. But, I, but they know that they can get me anytime, any day, seven days a week. I answer my phone. I do the research. I help them out when they're making decisions. So therefore, they give me their contingencies to sell. When somebody has a house to sell, they say, hey, give Mark Spain a call. But they also know that I don't go out and take junk. I mean, I actually I pitch it as a risk management tool, where meaning that I'm not going to go take an overpriced listing. I'm going to go out there and vet out this house and make sure they're not a hoarder. I want to make sure it's tight, staged. <laughs> listed price the price is right and, and, and i have it to be accountable to you to get that home sold so that's one thing um call i mean honestly circle prospecting and working working it's you know just picking up the phone buying buying a dialer like vulcan 7 or mojo and buying systems i mean just just working an area on the phones four hours a day is the cheapest way to make money and i think you would agree with me sean i mean that's the, that's the most cost effective way to generate seller leads just getting on the phone and they're not gonna I mean, if you talk to 15 people today, trust me, they're not going to all list houses and probably none of them are going to book an appointment. But what you're doing is building a relationship with those people. And then what you want to do is, again, it goes back to that give and take. It's a great book if you haven't read it. It's, it's, um, but basically, you're going to add value to those sellers or those future sellers. Creating The phone is creating a sales funnel for you. So you're taking 2,000 people and building it down to these 150 people. Of those 2,000 have an interest in selling over the next year. And then you're going to send them market analysis. You're going to call them once a month. You're going to do, you know, maybe you sponsor their neighborhood garage sale, but whatever you can do to basically market to those homeowners and add value in their life. You want to be so daggum valuable that they would never list with me or anybody else except yourself. Gotcha. Great job. Another question. By the way, I love you guys are, are typing in questions in the comments bar. It's always my intention to make at least 50 percent of the webinar make it uh, the content of that audience author. Now, I want you guys to get out of this what you came for, okay? So another great question, in fact, came from Sean, uh, Brian, oh, excuse me, Sean and Laura, both. What books do you most recommend, Mark? Um, so when somebody says, hey, I'm getting into the real estate business, uh, what books do you recommend I read? And, I, and, and there's a couple that I say, you know, read it a couple of times. I mean, so... One is the millionaire real estate agent. I tell people to read that at least two, maybe three times your first year in the business. The second book has nothing to do with real estate, but it's, it's a time management productivity book. It's called The One Thing. Uh, I'd, I'd read that. We actually buy that for almost every single agent that starts at our company. It's in, the, it's in their welcoming package. Um, I'd read that book at least in the, once when you first start, again, at month six and again at month 12, because throughout the three, three times in your, in, in that year, there's, you're going to have different iterations. It's going to mean something differently to you. And I, I read it at least once a year for myself. Uh, and then I would read the book, the e-myth, um, the e-myth. It's just going to be a book about systems. And I think if, I think he might have a version now specifically to real estate. I'm not sure. I know he has one that's called the e-myth revisited. It's an updated version. Yeah. He and Brad Corn are actually working on it right now. I don't know that it's ready to go. Okay. Yeah, so what's, what's that'll be a great book. Um, and then the fourth book I would read is called Relentless. Um, and and it basically, it's a book that was written by the trainer of Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan's personal trainer. And it just talks about mindset and what it takes to really become a superstar. W what are the prices and, and the things you have to give up in order to get to great um, and really to become a cleaner? So th those are four. Those are four things um, I would recommend at least reading a book a month. All right. So. Uh, let me get a, a picture of what your team looks like today. So uh, buyer's agents, how many do you have? We have right at about 37, I believe. Yeah. Um, listing specialists. 43. Okay. Um, transaction managers, admin. We have about a total of about nine admin not nine on the, what we call them client concierge or transaction coordinators. Gotcha. Okay. It's very ISA. efficient for the volume we do. That's very efficient. Undoubtedly. <laughs> uh, ISAs. Yeah, we have, ISAs. About, we have 10 ISAs and then a leader that we brought in from Verizon. Fantastic. Okay. So um, with that many buyer specialists, uh, we understand span of control. 
they can't all report to you. So how have you set up the organization to manage span of control issues? Yeah, so we have uh, directors of sales. So to total with, between the buyers and sellers, we have a total of five directors of sales, um, three in the headquarter office, and then there are the other three in the satellite offices. So um, typically how it would work as we continue to build out the infrastructure in Atlanta would be a sales director with, you know, 15 to 25 agents that report to them. And, and it's, it's corporate sales. I mean, it's, it's one-on-ones each week to go over their, you know, daily account, you know, month, weekly accountability, monthly accountability, sales goals. Um, and it's, I always tell somebody, I say, we have an awesome culture, but I'm going to let you know real quickly. It, it's high pressure, heavy accountability. You'll make a lot of money, but it'll be fun. But it's, it's, you're never going to find a, a, an athlete that doesn't have a heavy accountability and coaching and mentoring and push. But as, as we push and what we, what people will tell us in our culture, they actually finally get it and say, Hey, we actually know that you push us because we love you. And there's nothing that we're telling you to do or encouraging you to do that we wouldn't do ourselves. And then we invest a lot in training. I mean, you, I mean you're one, you're one of our trainers, so you, you can respect that. I mean, we, we invest a lot of money in training. Right. I think you paid me too much. So. That's probably, we were going to renegotiate that. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, <laughs> Okay, so give me an idea of the, well, first off, let me ask a question. Are you, uh, would you say you're a marketing-based company, prospecting enhanced, or a prospecting company, marketing enhanced? Yeah, we're a marketing-based company, prospecting enhanced, that, you know, um, our marketing creates the sales funnel from a really wide angle. Um, we also work really heavily for the past clients, referrals, repeat business, and market to them. And then we have a intensive follow up nurture, you know, plan. It's just really, really intense. Very cool. Very cool. Yet it wasn't always that way. In fact, in our pre-call market, remember you telling me that uh, when you first started out, you started visiting these new home sales offices, you'd bring them donuts on a weekly basis just to get into relationship with them, right? That was my sales funnel, man. I, 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 and say I, I'm a little bit crazy in the sense that I, I have to I have to gamify everything in my head, and I have to like really do things on an extreme, very much to the extreme. So I said, okay, if I have a hundred neighborhoods that I represent for the builders, and and they provide me business, hey, I got to make their lives awesome. And sitting in a neighborhood is probably one of the most boring things you can do. And so yeah. I want to make their lives exciting. So I would just gamify and say, okay, I've got a hundred. Pretend like I have a hundred kiosks out in the mall. And I got to service these kiosks. And so each week I would just drive around. It's just like, door, it was basically glorified door knocking, but I basically built relationships with these people and I would bring them Starbucks. I'd bring them Chick-fil-A. I'd bring them lemon ice, whatever we needed to bring them to make have create happiness out in a boring world. Because if, on a Wednesday, not many people are coming out to the suburbs looking at houses. Thursday, Friday, Saturdays when they show up. So we just, we want to, we, we became partners with these people and, you know, we built relationships and they're, you know, now they're obviously after this many years, we're just, we're good, all good friends. I mean, it's a fraternal world when you, when you build relationships. Yeah, Mark. And uh, one other tip that you shared with me in the pre-call is that you'd actually drive the neighborhood and you'd point out things that maybe needed to be corrected so that it would make the sales uh, process a little bit smoother. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, it's, they would ask me and say, hey, sales are slow. What, what can you suggest? Or a sales manager would say, hey, can you ride out to such and such a neighborhood and pull me a report on sales in the area, resales? Why are we losing sales? And then look at the neighborhood. So especially during the downturn, I mean, we added a lot of value to our builders. We would say, hey, we know you're not starting any more specs, which is, you know, just a pre-build. We know that, you know, there's not a lot of activity here. So, but when you come in and like the grass is growing out of the silt fence, four foot high, trash is all over the sites and it looks deserted, We've got to like, let's just fake it. Let's take these first three lots, take a bobcat, scrapple, scrape the ground up, put some gravel down. Let's make it look like we're starting a house. Let's, let's weed eat the edges of the neighborhood. And I would just do all kinds of things all the time to help look like there's life created in the neighborhood, including sometimes we'd have to put up under contract signs on empty lots that we knew we weren't selling, you know, right, wrong, and different at work. And we had to create some energy to basically give the neighborhood life because if everybody remembers back in 2010 and 11, I mean, in Atlanta, it's pretty dark. It's was, it was pretty dark everywhere. I'll <laughs> tell you that much. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, as a past yeah. developer, I loved a real estate agent to come in and add value to us in that way, right? Yeah. To, uh, if nothing else, you know what you need to do, yet having somebody stop in and just offering that advice, that support would undoubtedly add value to me as a developer. I love it. Okay, so a couple other questions. Um, Debbie asks, any suggestions you have for dealing with for sale by owners? 
and any particular scripts that are effective? Yeah. So for me, as I mean, I've never been a huge, and it's just just because it just was a source that we didn't choose to work for sale by owner. But um, I do know there's a lot of success in just adding value because I forget the statistic, but 90% or so of sale by owners end up listing with an agent, maybe in the high 80s. Um, it's just add value. Offer to do them a free CMA. Offer to, if their home gets under contract, you'll write the contract for them for a, like a 1% or half percent fee or free. All the, you know, go tour the, tell them that you want to go tour the house. So go tour the house for your buyers in the area and then add value to the, it's again, it goes back to that give and take. If you add value to them and you build a relationship beyond what anybody else is willing to do, they will end up, if they need an agent, go to the person they feel the most comfortable and they trust the most. Um, and not necessarily who has the best track record in that neighborhood. I mean, it, it really just goes back to rapport and, and relation relationship building. So when you go visit them or you send them something through FedEx or UPS, like a package that you might create. And there's a lot of trainers that offer like out of the box type stuff um, for FISBO packages. I don't have one. This just, again, it's not a box that we, we serve. Um, but I do know that my friends who work that world are very successful in doing what I'm saying. Yeah, well, undoubtedly, and and Mark, you're you're proving to us that there's more than one way to be successful in the business, right? Oh, oh, yeah. out, you need to call for sale by owners, or you need to do circle prospecting, or you need to call expired listings. I don't see many of them out there saying, "Hey, just go visit a hundred new home sales communities per month," right? Yeah, so yeah and, I, just, and I think that, and I think that you have to find, and what I learned early on too, you have to find the source of business or the lead generation. If you told me, Mark Spain, you're going to have to go out and door knock, you know, 200 doors a day, five days a week, or you can't be in this business. Unless my family was starving, dude. I, I mean, that is so far from my personality that I would just, I, I would probably die. I mean, I could force myself to do it for survival, but that's probably about the least extent I could do it. But if you said, Hey, go visit a bunch of hundred neighborhoods and builders and build relationships and bring them lunch and add value in their world. I'd be like, Oh, that's, that's me because that's who I am. And so for me is, is I would encourage you to find, I have a friend, her name is Anna Kalinsky and she crushes it in the city of Atlanta and, 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 and her neighborhoods where she door knocks with her dog and things. And she just crushes it. And I look at her like, I, I think I would just panic in the driveway and not be able to get, I mean, I, I don't even know what I would do, um, but she kills it. And she's, <laughs> she just is what she's, she's amazing. And she is so impressive because that fits her wheelhouse, but she might not fit the wheelhouse that I might be working. So make sure that because you want to do something that you're, you can feel when I talk about the builder and the neighborhoods. I mean, that's where my, you can feel my passion because if you're passionate about something, you're going to put your energy in 110% of your effort. Um, but if you're not, you're, you're going to crash after two or three weeks. You're not going to keep doing something that you don't like to do. There's no doubt about that. All right. So, um, Great input. Hey, by the way, uh, one of our moderators, uh, Mike, he, he put a link up there in the comments box for you all. We do have uh, free access to some of the agent tools. In fact, we've got a toolkit that includes expired listing scripts for sale by owner listing script uh, uh, objectors, uh, the proven best practice around lead follow-up scripts, which uh, Mark, I know you guys do a ton of lead follow-up, right? Because the phone is ringing off the hook nonstop because your marketing plan how do you follow up with these leads? What's the most effective from your perspective? Yeah. So we have, you know, we, we have a, and we, AB, we, no, first of all, we test things. We, we test scripts. We, you know, we have uh, a script coach that we have for our inside sales team. Um, Eric, our inside sales manager is constantly working with them, tweaking scripts. They have script practice. Um, it's really heavy. If, if we don't book the appointment the first day, we also know that within that first 10 days, if it's not booked, it's going to be on a long term nurture because it's just statistically what's proven is somebody either lists their house or decides to, you know, when they're going on the site looking for a home to buy a house, it ha that, that appointment's booked in that first 10 days or it's a little bit slower burn, meaning that it's a little bit slower time to convert. And, and you still have to stay in front of them and all our outbound marketing system goes out and keeps touching them and we keep calling them. But it's just super intense that first 10 days. And so that's kind of our that's kind of our box that we perfected. We've tried a bazillion different things and we always try it because we feel like we're never going to make it there. We're never perfect, but we always keep trying things and try to get it better. And then we measure the results. We I mean we measure the results. We measure the two through 10 day convert, you know, one day conversion, which is, hey, how many leads do we get today and how many appointments do we book? That's what they want. I mean, that's the first day conversion. And then we we measure day two through 10. What's the conversion there? And then day 10 plus 
you know, 11 plus we measured because so the, there's three different buckets of people. Um, and you, they don't raise their hand and tell you what they are. They don't even know what they are. We have <laughs> our job is to use data and scripts to figure that out. So from your perspective, what are those three buckets? I want to know. Yeah. So basically it's just, you know, a hot lead that's going to convert. They call us today. They're ready to list their house. There's, there's the ones that come in that we're not able to get a hold of because just they, it was an e-lead and they didn't put their phone number. Remember, they're probably like people like me that, Hey, I'm actually ready. I just don't really want to talk to anybody. And they're going to convert whenever I hit them in that four or five days, day six. And then there's people that are just kicking the tires that might've heard an ad that might've just wanted their home valued. They're thinking about it. So after day 10, so say day 11 through whatever, they could convert in day 60. They can convert in day 120. Uh, there are people that's, you know, that those are people that are, we consider nurturers. And sometimes it's like, Hey, if I could find that right house, I'd move. Okay. Well, yeah. our job is to find you that right house. There you go. It's kind of like an ABC type prospect. There you go. I like it. Okay. Well, very cool. So there's a couple of I wanted to ask you personally. Uh, in our pre-call, you had mentioned a couple of defining moments, things that really changed the trajectory of your career. If you could maybe share some of those defining moments with us and, and why it was important and how it impacted you and shifted those actions to really grow one of the world's highest producing teams. Go ahead. Yeah. So... Um, I was with Remax for about 15 years, um, top three producer, top two producer for five of those 15 years, um, top 10 for 10 of them. I mean, we were a heavy producer, but what, what in full transparency, I had become really bored, um, had a team of probably, I don't know, six, eight people. Um, but. 08, 09, 010, the market was shifting. I mean, I was probably going to the gym and just being honest, just from boredom, probably three hours a day. I was in a boot camp class. I was running. I was doing, I mean, it just, it was more just to keep my mind occupied because I was so bored. I mean, my, and it was, and what I didn't know, what, what had happened is, I mean, I, I honestly, I'm probably the hardest working individual anybody will ever meet. I mean, ever. And if you got up at four, I'd get up at three. If you got up at three, I get up at two. I mean, it's just, I'm a, I'm a, a little bit crazy, insane person in the sense that I have a very intense work ethic because I love to win. But what I didn't understand was leverage. And nobody really had ever taught me leverage. I mean, I, I heard the list of the last leverage piece and I got that part down and I was doing, and, and, and sometimes when you make it to a somewhat of a top of an organization, you think you, and you can kind of start believing your own BS and thinking that you might've made it. Um, but what it was is I was missing some key relationships in my life. And so I left Remax in 2011, joined Keller Williams and got into a relationship with a guy named Gary Keller and being around him and just watching how these macro thinkers think and having somebody really push me to a higher level and realize that I was thinking way, way too small. I mean, like, I can remember going into the first mastermind uh, and he would just, there's a small group of us in his office and he was, he was like, Spain, how many transactions are you going to do in the next three years? And I'm like, mm, 500. You're thinking too small. I'm like, okay, here's the way this is going to go. And he just kept, and I said, 750. And he said, you're still thinking too small. I said, all right, how about a thousand? And I'm like, you're getting there, but I still think you can do more. And the amazing thing about it is, is he pushed me, to, to such a big, bigger thoughts and, and really change my mindset and business and life that uh, he, he, I have a lot of respect for that person. I mean, I just, um, I'm very, very grateful to him because he taught me how to think bigger. And in 2013, when I joined Keller Williams, we did probably about 450 transactions, 420 transactions that year, three years later. So that's 2011, 2013, we closed 1,446 transactions. Um, so to say that man impacted my life and helped me think differently uh, is an understatement. And what he taught me was leverage. I mean, that, the bottom line is what I learned from him and I walk away with among many things, but the big rock is leverage. And one of the most impactful things that he said to me was when you're unhappy in any area of your life, you're missing a person. And I learned that if you're unhappy in your marriage, you might need a marriage counselor. If you're unhappy in your spirituality, and then you might need a, a spiritual counselor, a preacher, a priest, finance, finance coach, sales. You might be missing a sales manager or a sales agent. Admin, whatever your situation is, always goes back to people. And what he taught me was 
really how to put pressure on the hires and really how to put pressure on the people in our organization and really, really becoming a, a, a such a driving force and, and knowing that the highest return on any investment you ever make is going to be in people. And Sean knows our organization well. And if you looked at it five years ago and look at it today, I mean, it is a night and day, not even in the same wheelhouse of the people and what we've done and the amount of investment we put in people. And we put a lot of pressure on our hires. And so that's a big deal. I mean, that was a defining moment. Um, just that real, that five year relationship I have with them. And I went independent and went on, you know, created Mark Spain real estate in January, 2016. Um, and, and, and here we are today. How the other, the other tipping point in my life was when I joined, um, I left my company in 2012 and started, uh, back. It was when the hedge funds and the private equity and wall street firms were beginning to get into real estate. And I actually left Mark Spain Real Estate, left John, um, our president, to run the company. And I became the regional head and built out all the infrastructure for the Atlanta operations for Imitation Homes, which is a Blackstone company. And hired all the people, hired all the construction. I mean, we were buying you know, thousands and thousands of homes. Um, but what, what it really taught me was the people in the world that make the most money and who do the biggest things are macro thinkers. They don't get caught in the weeds. They, they think big and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you're not going fast enough, put more pressure on you. I mean, that was a, that was an intense world, but man, I learned so much. And, and, you know, and I also learned a lot about myself as I'm an entrepreneur and, um, I, I love being in business for myself. I love building things. Um, but really if you, if you hear those two stories and those two tipping points and being around the, you know, the, the macro thinkers of Blackstone, which, you know, the billionaire type people, the way they think, the way Gary thinks, and also just being in relationships with those people. It, it, I'm not telling you any book I read. What I'm telling you is I had relationships with people that changed my life. And so I'm encouraging you is wherever you're at in your life, if you're a $10 million producer and you want to get to a $100 million producer, then go out and find some people that are doing that and start hanging around those people so they will pull you up. Because if you're a hundred million dollar producer and you start hanging around a bunch of people that are doing 10 million, they're going to pull you down because we all, it's just, and it's not anybody's a bad person. What it is, is they think differently at different iterations of your success and your, and your, and your, and your layering of your, or laddering of your success, you're going to think differently. Um, mm -hmm. and well, you really, have to. yeah, you really have to. I, and I think here's one of the biggest challenges in business gang is that every level of success requires its own combination of what you do, how you do it and who you do it with. Here's where the challenge comes in. The what, how, and who that gets you to this level of success doesn't automatically transform to a better combination of what, how, and who that gets you to this level of success, right? So it's you're constantly changing your mindset, your expectations of yourself, as well as your actions and habits. So how has coaching really helped you get there? I hate coaching. <laughs> what do you mean? You know, it's funny and I'm in coaching. So I have a coach and I've had a coach for a long time. So don't, don't I, I take that lightly in, in, a, in, a, in a kidding kind of way. But, and I always tell my coach, I, I hate this, man, I, because it's like, it puts so much pressure and accountability that actually makes you do the stuff that you don't want to do. And it actually works. And so <laughs> as an entrepreneur, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And so he laughs at me. He knows me very well. He, he, he laughs at me. Um, but no, I think that coaching is, is critical to your success and, you know, um, in anything. And it's, it's kind of like about that book I was telling everybody to read Relentless. It's all about Michael Jordan's personal coach. He had coaches on the field and out in the court, but these are his personal coaches that he went out and hired. Um, and again, in any, any area of your life that you, you feel like you need improvement on, I mean, a coach, if it could, you know, fitness. I mean, I have, a, I have a lady that, you know, that trains and does a lot of stuff with me and my wife. Um, it's because we just want to be in better health and we want to be better fit. And she pushes us beyond what we do on our own, just like a business coach or a script coach or a trainer. Um, I would say every single one of our, our leaders are in coaching. We don't, every single one of them. Oh, yeah. So we, we spend a ton of money, a ton, ton, ton of money on coaching, but it works. I mean, well, everybody within your organization is very coachable. How important is that? Oh, that's, that's critical. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, you, you gotta be honest with yourself and you, and we, and, and you also have to hire people that are coachable and, and, and malleable. And, and basically you, you, we don't hire, we try not to hire people that know everything. I mean, we, nobody wants, I mean, it's, 
if you can show me a better way, I'm in all ears, man. Show me, teach me. And I, I, we're, we're big, big learners and coaching helps that. Good job. No doubt about it. And speaking to learning, I believe that when we feed our minds, it'll feed our future. So our business grows to the extent that you do. Now, I want to just put something up on the screen to show everybody real quick. Um, something that I'm kind of excited about, actually. So uh, as I do this, um, it's going to go blank for about again. So bear with me. All right. Okay, we're back. So future icon of the month webinars, I just want to let you know. Uh, and again, gang, these are always free. Mark Spain today, we got Craig Northrop, August 3rd. We got Ryan O'Neill, September 7th. And uh, past webinars. Now, this is a part that I'm really excited about. Replays are now available at iconcoachingre.com. So what we do is we pull them down for a little while, and then we're going to put them back up on the site for you. Now, one other thing, because a lot of people um, that I know uh, in fact, I wish I could give a dollar away to charity for every time I've heard this quote up on the screen. I'd love to be coached. I'm just not ready to spend a thousand dollars per month yet. So uh, I wanted to I wanted to come up with a solution for people, and we developed the Icon Accelerate. It's 90 days to your success, gang. All the things on the left they're included in the fee, and it's super duper cheap. So you get fourteen hundred ninety five dollars worth of value for a one time payment of seven hundred fifty or payment plan, three payments of $299. And gang, I think that that is probably one of the easiest things you could do to improve your trajectory. And it's it's the least amount of investment for the amount of value you're going to get out of that. So I, I believe you've got a, a maybe an offer that's appeared on the right side of your screen. If you guys are interested, you want to learn more, just click on that. Check it out. And those who are super serious about bringing your, your career to the next level, and you're not kidding yourself, uh, you can reach out to us for a strategy session. Now, that's free of charge. What we're going to do is we're going to share our models, our tools, and our systems that we've learned from people just like Mark that are out there doing it every single day. And again, it's free. So we'll focus in on the gaps that exist in your business, and we'll develop a plan together to help you bridge those gaps. So there's a special offer, again, off on, on the right side. Feel free to check that out. Um, and by the way, the special offer has to do with the pricing associated with the Icon Accelerate. That pricing is going to go up in two hours time, guys. So you're going to see a timer there. I really want you to invest in yourself and take action. Now I'm going to go ahead and stop this. We're going to get back to your questions with Mark. Yet, yeah, thanks for letting me. Okay, we're back. So I wanted to put that out there because I believe that the more you feed your mind, the better you feed your future. So uh, a couple of questions here, Mark, for you. Uh, Amanda asks, and we've got somebody who really likes her question as well. How did you build your confidence to go after the clients and face rejection and still keep doing what you were doing? Well, I can remember a story when somebody told me about Colonel Sanders. I might have read about on, on Jim Rome where he... To sell his Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe, I think he was told 2,200 2, plus no's. Um, so if Colonel Sanders at almost age 60 could go through that many no's, I figure I could be rejected a few times. Um, I don't think anybody likes rejection. Um, I think that you have to, you know, in my, in my career and study in sales, um, I learned that that was part of it. And if you want to be successful, you know, always remember a no is one step closer to yes. And I always just try to keep that in my mind. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like shove it off and act like nose or, you know, who cares? Well, I mean, it does bother anybody. Hell, I hate to freaking lose, man. I love to win. And when I don't get my yes, I actually, if I don't get a listing, this is how competitive I am. If I don't get a listing, I will call back a seller and say, Hey, so that I can get better. Can you tell me why you listed with Jim Smith and not me? Because I just want the feedback because I can get better. Because honestly, I thought we had a great rapport. I thought I had this and you know, I'll, and I'll tell them, I'm like, you know, I like to win and you'd be surprised how many times I get listings 90 days later because I actually make that call, but I'm really doing it. Not because I'm trying to get the listing at that point. I really want to learn what I did wrong because I, I, I by golly, I want to win. Um, so I just think that you can't get hung up on you're, 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 You can't get hung up on that outcome. You got to just keep pushing through. You got to have grit. You got to study it. And like Sean had mentioned, I mean, you got to marinate your mind with things and, edu and and thoughts so that you can push through that. Because when you have a lot of positive things in your head, when negativity comes through it, it's like it's almost like it repels it. You don't feel it. 
excellent point. Good job. Um, I, I was thinking about some of you were talking about how competitive you are. I heard a story about Alan Dom, who you mentioned earlier. In fact, he's the condo king of Philadelphia, right? But he predominantly sells in three buildings. And if another agent happens to list a, a condo in one of those buildings, Alan Dom will just buy it. And the reason for that is because he wants 100% market share in each one of those buildings. And he prides himself on that to the point he'll buy it, throw a tenant in there, and uh, just wait for the market to improve. And he'll sell it a little bit later. <laughs> Talk about competitive, well, right? Yeah, that's, that's, I get that. I get it. It's, 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 you know, you, you have to figure out what makes you tick. And, uh, I've learned, you know, several years ago that really winning is what drives me. It's, it's really nothing else except winning. I love it. Okay. Um, Rick asks to super Spain. Um, <laughs> we have one billboard and you have 150. What's on your billboards? Um, we, we, we have several different ones. I mean, it's, some of them say, um, your home sale sold guaranteed or we'll buy it. Some say we have like all our digital boards are, are, are constantly changing where we update them weekly with, uh, how many homes we sold year to date. Um, we have some that say, uh, you know, serving Atlanta, Metro Atlanta for 20 years. Um, so we have a variety of different ones. I mean, it's about four to six core ones. And then we always have seasonal billboards for, you know, holiday messages. Um, so I've done both things, uh, simple branding ones. So now it's about an 80% call to action, 20% branding. Gotcha. Okay. And I started um, out, I mean, honestly, I started out with one, then I got three, then I got 14. I mean, it's, this is tw I think about 20 years in the making. So don't, you know, just, just, you got to lean in there. if it's working. So, I mean, some markets, I know billboards don't work. It's just depending on your market. There you go. Okay. So, um, uh, let me ask, um, I, and I didn't clear this with you on the, the pre-call yet. Um, are you willing to be a little bit transparent about compensation models and structure around buyer's agents? Uh, yeah, I don't mind saying what our buyer's agents are you know, on a comp plan. Um, so That's basically, so basically we have a, on the, on the buyer team, we have a, it's a, it's a 60, 40 split um, on, on team generated business where it's really a, what it is, it's a 40, 10, 40, which means that, that uh, our 40, 10, 50, where 10 percent is basically going into the ISA department that, that generates the business, books the appointment, pre-qualifies the lead and books that agent appointment. The agent gets 40 percent and the, the rest you know, rolls into the team. Okay, let's um, pause right here because I want, I want you all to hear this. If you're a buyer's agent on the Mark Spain team, the ISA department sets all your appointments for you, does all the follow up for the most part. I mean, certainly if you want to be proactive, if you want to make more money, then you can do some lead generation on your own. You can do your lead follow up and you're going to be booking appointments on your own. Yet the ISA team has been trained specifically to book appointments for the buyer's agents. Correct? Right. Yeah. So we, so, and that model works. I mean, it, you know, it took us about a year to transition into that model. And I can guarantee you, I've had agents that have been on the team for many years and would say they would never, and they, everybody was nervous about going from a 50 50 split. I mean, hell, I was. I wasn't really sure how everybody was going to react. I basically went around the country and studied how other teams were doing it to basically create a model because I did, you know, I, I learned that that's the best way to get information is go study what other people are doing it and come back and perfect it and basically put your, put your touch on it and make it fit your team. So I just studied what other teams were doing. I wasn't creating it. Um, and we needed, you know, we basically were having this other huge department, the inside sales department about four years ago. And somehow that department had to get paid and we all talked through it. And, and this is the model that works. I mean, but we book, I mean, we book eight, I mean, we book probably 30, 40 appointments a day. I mean, it's, it's, it's a machine. That's awesome. Uh, so Nate asks, how do you track your metrics? Yeah. So, source so of, specific to source of the lead. Yeah. So w what happens is that it comes into the, I mean, our online registrations have the, have, have the sources. So anytime mm -hmm. it's an online registration, we source it that way. Um, we also, the bulk of it is sourced by the inside sales department. we basically are salary agents who basically say, Hey, where did you hear about us? What made you, what made you call us? If it's a referral source. Boom. What is it? If it's a advertising campaign, what was it? And then that's all tracked into Salesforce and then spits out a dashboard. You could simply track it in a Google Docs or a Smartsheet. I mean, it doesn't have to be Salesforce. but And then I get a report at the end of every day that says, hey, we got 
X number of leads and these are all the sources. And so every, and then I have a daily lead count and a month to date lead count on every you know, buyers, sellers. Um, and I just track the numbers. I know, I know if I'm off or on, I know what I should get every day. I can tell you on a day, I could be living in China and tell you if our business is working or it's off. And it's only because I track about four or five numbers. All right. Uh, Mark, we're at the top of the hour. You mind going a few extra minutes? We got a, just a bunch of questions that are flo floating in. No, go ahead. Let's go. Beautiful. Uh, Christy asks, how do you recommend getting out of the weeds? She, she says, I keep getting sucked back in every day. Yeah, we call that the vortex. <laughs> um, time block. Yep. You just have to time block. You have to be so, so committed to your time block and committed to your goals that you're willing to do whatever it takes including having somebody else hold you accountable. So if it's just to say you're not really good at lead generation, which is probably 90% of us. And that should be your one thing. I mean, follow up is the one thing. Lead generation and follow up is the one thing for every single person on this call. If you're in real estate, if you got a perfect, if you, you can do anything, you could be terrible, but if you're good at lead generation, you're going to make a fortune. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You can be terrible at negotiating contracts, but if you have more leads than everybody else, you're going to win the game. Um, and you just time block. And, I wouldn't recommend tomorrow start for four hours. I mean, start for start for an hour this week. The next week, do, do an hour and 15. Next week, do an hour and a half. And just keep leaning into it until you get your habits down. And it'll take you about 60 days to, to perfect that habit and have somebody hold you accountable. If you're in an office with a broker, I recommend coming in the office and doing your lead generation. in the. I'm a big believer about being in the office and not trying to do it from home. I mean, there's rare, very few people in the world that can do this business from home at a high level. You, so there are people that can do it, but it's not very many of us. Um, this is because of distractions. Undoubtedly. Um, so when's the last time you went on a listing appointment? Oh, it's probably been probably two or three years ago. I mean, I, every once in a while I have an older past client that a husband passed away or something happened. That's such a, you know, it's a special deal that I'll, I'll actually take a listing partner with me, but I'll go in there just because I'm the conduit and I'll make the person feel comfortable and whether they're trying to transition to the next stage of life. Um, outside of that, unless it's just some super, super ultra luxury type product, um, even today I won't do that. Um, it's just because it's just not my role. I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm leading the company. Um, I have people that are a lot better at it than me. Very cool. Um, so I've been to uh, Atlanta, <clears throat> let's see, five times this year. Every morning I get up in the hotel, I flip on the news, I'm getting ready for the day, and I see you and Barbara Corcoran there on the television, and, and it, four or five times by the time I get out the door, and I get ready pretty fast. <laughs> so uh, how did you get into television, and uh, how did it start? How did it turn into what it is today? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's kind of like going back to that day when I started with one billboard and grew it to three or five or ten. I mean, I did the same thing, and I only pick one medium at a time to, to perfect, and got the billboard game, you got postcards, boom, newspapers, boom, segue from there to billboards. Then I did radio and only pick one station at a time to really go hard on and, 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 and lean in. Now we're on probably, you know, eight or nine different stations. Um, TV, you know, I've been playing on TV for almost probably a little over three, maybe four years. And I just, I played with it. I mean, I, I made, trust me, I, I spent a fortune making mistakes. I mean, I, I burned through some cash. You know, um, where I think it's either my way or I go too cheap or I try to go on the wrong station. Um, and, and again, I just it's all math. I mean, lead generation and, and, and media buying is math. And so you, you spend X dollars, you know what your leads can cost you and you get an output and you have to give it a good burn rate because it doesn't just start working the first month. I mean, sometimes it could take six, 12 months to start working and you got to know where those thresholds are and have enough capital that doesn't put you in a bind to get you there. And it's, we just set aside a certain number of amount of capital to basically say, Hey, we're going to try this medium. And sometimes we go too hard, too fast, too quick. And we have to pull back and say, Hey, we're going to repunt. I mean, we just went through the most expensive house seat election in the history of America. There was $40 million spent in Atlanta uh, on a house seat. And they didn't jack everything we were doing in media for the last 90 days through June 20th. And it was, everything was a mess and it just, it, our frequencies are off. We lost our spots, but we just had to work through those things and pay attention. I mean, we were paying attention and our, you know, and we were holding our ad reps accountable so that when we got through the other side, they helped us, helped us perfect this. And so, um, 
I love advertising. I love doing things that aren't necessarily the simplest and you just read a book and just push play. I mean, if you have to continually tweak the messaging, you have to tweak your endorser. It's not, it's not, it's not simple, but it's fun because it kind of, you got to trial and error, AB test stuff. And I, I like that. I mean, that, that's kind of part of the game. No, no doubt about that. Okay. So, um, there's a question on my mind, uh, specific to, uh, radio. Now, before I get there though, you shared with me in our pre-call, uh, the importance of reinvesting in your business. In essence, as you're growing to pay yourself kind of last, right? Right. What sacrifices did you make to get where you are today? Oh, a ton. And I've made a, I've made a mistakes for everybody on this particular call, man. I've, if there's anything dumb that's been done, I've trust me, I've done it. Um, there's one thing that you said that really stood out to me, and that was how many miles were on your car? Oh, wow. Well. Yeah, so um, I, I was a road warrior, so I, I was driving probably 50,000 miles a year. I mean, I, I put 458,000 miles on my SUV. Um, I live way below my means. I lived in a, you know, how a small, you know, small house on a slab, just simple, 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 simple for about eight years. Uh, and honestly, it was advice from Gary Keller where he just said, you know, um, there's a period that I was, I personally was living high on the hog and just, you know, we were making money and spending money. And I just, you know, in about 07, I got really focused, got really dialed in and just simplified my life. Um, live way, way from the extreme below my means and just took and invested back in our company. Um, and, and it paid off. I mean, Gary, I just remember Gary telling me how he just, how important it was just to, to, to if you want your business to grow, this is the way you got to do it. And just really live way below your means, take that extra cash, either stockpile it or, or, or hold it to basically invest in your business. And then you can take the risk. But when you don't have the capital, you can't take the risk. There you go. Okay, here's a good question. Well, I know it's going to be different market to market, yet between radio, television, postcards, um, newspapers, and billboards, what gives you the hard, highest ROI? Um, I mean, if I'm an agent, I mean, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, pre, I want to answer it in a couple of different ways. I mean, if I'm an agent starting and I want to do some marketing, I mean, I would start out with doing postcards. I think that's the highest return on your investment. Um, and you don't have to start out spending, you know, twenty thousand dollars a month. I mean, you can start out spending a couple of grand, fifteen hundred thousand, but whatever you can afford. Um, it's got to be a big enough audience or big enough reach that makes an impact and makes the phone ring. You got to understand, only about five percent of the homes in in, in in America turn over every year. So just you got to do the do that math. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's market to market. I mean, I, you know, for us, it's 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 a toss up between all three because really what happens is we have spokes in the wheel. So you have people see your billboard, they hear your radio, then they see your commercial. So it's just, I mean, they're all probably equally important in, in our marketing arsenal, you know, along with digital. I mean, digital is a huge, we have a huge digital reach as well. So um, I can't tell you if there's one, one source. I mean, I'm, I'm a mass media guy by heart. I mean, I, I built my brand on the terrestrial media. I mean, I have my, my director of marketing, Joe ran a digital ad agency. So you can understand this little tug of war he and I have. I mean, he used to think that everything I did was like old and outdated and he actually now knows that it works. Um, and, 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 you know, and he, he does all this crazy. I mean, he's major, major, major digital guy. So it's kind of, we've had a great marriage and we've helped each other grow. So, um, you know, I think just, um, whatever you do in any market, you have to just try things. You have to try it for a period of time and AB test it and make sure you're getting your return. I mean, you know what the average commission is in your market and you have to know what you're willing to pay for a lead to make yourself an X number, you know, X dollars of profit based on your conversion. Very good. So Jennifer asks, uh, has social media advertising been successful for you? And if so, what works? Yeah. Um, it, it does work. Um, yeah, we generate a significant amount of leads. And what works is, and, and this is, this is where we had to really, because it's interesting with advertising, you can do things that make you feel good and that make the audience feel good. That doesn't make the phone ring. And I'm an in your face call to action. And that's what works. And that's what works on Facebook too. That's what works on in any of our digital channels. Um, so find your messaging and, and make it a strong to call to action. And you can do a split between, you know, 50, 50, 
brand building, storytelling, 50% call to action, 70, you figure out what mix works. And I will tell you one thing that we have learned too, is <clears throat> there is a seasonality to like, we have a lot of storytelling ads, but we can't run our storytelling ads that win a lot of awards and do really awesome in April, May, and June when the freaking phone's blowing up and people are just really inaggressive. I mean, there's a seasonal. So we, what we've learned is, you know, some of that storytelling stuff works in a slower market for us and builds brand equity. But when the market starts moving heavy, we have to go back to that strong call to action because we, now we have all the competitors trying, you know, we have this, this, they're trying to get it. We're trying to get our piece of the voice and we want our message to be heard. And it gets really crowded during the peak times of the market. So for us is we have to be just as aggressive, if not more aggressive than anybody else. So just think call to action, think what's going to make you unique and what's going to make your phone ring. And, and social media is no different. It's just, it's just, an, it's a modern version of a newspaper. Can you just real quick share one CTA? Audrey asked, uh, just share one CTA with us. I mean, it could be, it, it could, it could be that, you know, one, one of ours could be just, you know, we, we, we would, one of our messages that works really cool is we sold this, you know, we'll put an address and a picture of a house and it says one, I'm making up a minute, one, two, three main street sold for 104% of asking price in three days. Give us, you know, if you want your home sold, call us today. It's that simple. And they can click a button and they can make the phone ring. Um, it could be our guaranteed sell message. Um, it could be, you know, a specialization in a neighborhood, you know, um, it, but it just always has to end with a call to action. Meaning like pick up the phone and call us, call, call, call. It's very cool. All right. So uh, any last words of wisdom, Mark? I know I've kept you almost an extra 15 minutes. Thanks for the extra time, buddy. You're what uh, would you say to our audience today that would just improve their trajectory, improve their income and their lifestyle? Yeah. I a couple of things. I mean, first off, I mean, just always remember that your success and the trajectory of your success is always tied to your the proportion or the amount of personal development you invest in yourself. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, it could be going to an Anthony Robbins seminar or Robin Sharma or whomever, uh, Darren Hardy or people I like. Um, always be a student. Commit to at least, you know, five days a week to marinate in your mind 30 minutes or more in some type of education. If you want your, if you want to go faster, then, you know, then increase the amount of time you're putting into personal development. I mean, I know some guys on, in our world that spend a couple hours a day. And by the way, Warren Buffett, I believe, reads four to five hours a day every day in his office. Just to kind of give you an idea of what, what, what heavy successful people do in reading and studying. And then just pay attention to what you're doing and pay attention to who you hang around with. Because if you want to be super successful... Um, you need to hang around successful people and find people in your world that can help pull you up versus pull you down. Um, and then finally, know that in this business, we are in the lead generation business. And this will be the final thing that I'll mention to you is that if you want to become the very best in this business, then you have to perfect lead generation. And that means perfect follow up and perfect, you know, doing follow up tasks, you know, three to four hours a day if you're going to become a savant. And you know, commit to it and have somebody hold you accountable. Hire a coach. If you're not good at it and you're not good at dis you know, disciplining yourself, I mean, by all means, go out and hire a coach and somebody that can help you get to the other side. Because I can tell you, every single major league baseball, NFL, pro NBA player, they all have coaches both on the court and off the court. Um, and that's important. No doubt. Mark, thank you so much. Thanks for being our icon here in July of 20. And I look forward to our future conversations and, and having you add some more value to this audience today. So thank you again. Well, thanks for having me. And I appreciate everybody being on the call. All right, buddy. I'll see you soon. See you, Take care. Bye-bye.